Moving on from the immediate to the eternal, up next we have two scholars who have taken precious time off their eminent work as professionals in the corporate and the diplomatic and political uh, sectors respectively to plumb the depths of medieval and ancient Indian texts to shed light on our civilization through its philosophy, its literature and various other spheres of thought, particularly the foundational ideas of dharma and kaam. At a time when religious identity is being reduced to a weapon in the political battleground and morality to an increasingly hegemonic authoritarian idea, their works assume renewed importance. This evening, we are going to be focusing on the idea of calm, which is sometimes simplistically translated into sexual desire, but, it, but, but in fact, it is so much more. It is desire that propels our life, guides our actions, shapes our relationships, confronts our social and moral mores. It brings us fulfillment, joy, meaning, but it also sometimes brings us fear, anxiety, and guilt. To quote H.H. H. Wilson's translation of the 129th hymn of the 10th bundle of Rig Veda, which is also known as the hymn of creation, in the beginning there was desire, which was the first seed of the mind. To give us a sense of what desire has meant to our civilization, please welcome Gurcharan Das and Pavan Varma. Hello and welcome. Mr. Verma, I'll start with you, if I may. Um, you know, we've had in Indian tradition, we've had a fairly open and in fact celebratory exploration and understanding of karma and desire. When did you, when do you think we started to lose that openness? I think there are many reasons why we lost that openness, but first it's important to understand why we had that porousness to the acceptance of desire and the sensual. And that stems from the fact that the Hindu worldview is exceptionally pragmatic. There are four purushas, dharma, artha, kama, moksha. And in those purushas, kama is mentioned. In fact, uh, in the first chapter of the Kama Sutra, uh, many people think it's only about impossible postures, but uh, it's actually a book that demonstrates, symbolizes a philosophical outlook to life. So Vatsyayan in the first chapter is asked by an imaginary interlocutor, and we were discussing this the other day, why do we need this book? And Vatsyayan's answer is, that if the four purushars in the Hindu worldview are dharma, artha, kama, moksha, each of the first three pursued in proportion and none in exclusion lead automatically to the fourth which is moksha. In other words, dharma, artha and kama in proportion and not in exclusion have philosophical validity as a goal unto itself. And if they have philosophical validity, it's not enough just to be a lover, but to be an accomplished lover, and therefore this book. So that, that is the reasoning of the Kama Sutra, and the reasoning behind why there was this porousness to the sensual, but as part of an overall balanced life. It was never an exclusion, ever. Having said that, I think that somewhere, the great love lore of Krishna and Radha, the floodgates of sensuality opened up by Jay Jayadev, followed by Chandidas, Bihari, uh, whole range of poets who spoke in very sensual imagery of the love lore of Radha and Krishna. All of that got somewhat uh, tainted by Victorian morality. And we have now a strange strange phenomena that those who go about harassing young couples in parks say they are doing it on behalf of Indian culture when they are actually victims of Victorian morality. <laughs> now that's the irony that has happened because the British were relentlessly critical about certain aspects of Indian civilization which was largely a reason for them to prove that India needed the ennobling, civilizing touch of the British. 
unfortunately the indian elite and much of india internalized that critique and therefore tried to sanitize its own legacy and heritage of some of the sensual elements such as for instance krishna's great love lore with radha in fact they said it's the atma searching for the paramatma and sort of removed all the carnality from it which was to which was to impoverish indian heritage so net net what you see is uh, uh, victorian morality and those who internalized it in the indian elite made it worse if i may say so mahatma gandhi is one of the greatest men the world has seen but a grateful nation not only internalized his great and towering legacies but also embraced many of his minor fads and one of them related to sex i mean we couldn't show kissing on the indian screen and mahatma gandhi is on record to have written that if a man and a woman embrace each other for any other purpose except the express purpose of procreation it's tantamount to sin so from one extreme we have swung to the other extreme but mahatma gandhi i can still understand what i can't understand are the louts who go about trying to harass young couples You've preempted a lot of my questions, uh, sir, and I hope to uh, return to a lot of points that you've made over there. But, uh, Mr. Das, coming to you uh, for a minute, you have posited the karma riddle as a clash between karma optimists and karma pessimists. And in your view, this has existed since time immemorial in our culture. Could you give us a uh, a quick explanation of what you mean by that right and i will and uh, i think i will agree with on one point with pavan and disagree on another point and let me say where i agree and that is that we make the mistake in thinking that the kama sutra which you started with was a book about sexual positions but actually uh, i would just illustrate the point that uh, pavan is making that it's a book of manners it's a book of good manners for example it says that if you want to be socially successful talk about the other person don't talk about yourself if you want to be successful it says don't speak in sanskrit speak in the language of the people otherwise you they'll think she'll think you're a show off if you want to be socially successful if you want to be a good seducer give think of her pleasure first before you think of yours i mean it's full of such gems and so i think that the people who who really i mean the vatsayana really had something going for him now <clears throat> where i disagree with pavan and that is the answer to your question that he blames the victorians only but in fact pessimism about karma goes back to the upanishads and the most pessimists actually were the buddhists the jains who really saw uh, uh sex and desire as a obstacle to their project the yogis the rishis you know who remember they they those those apsaras who come in the uh, uh in the rishis heads and there's an there's an involuntary ejaculation as a result and all the merit goes away of 1000 years well the fact is that the history of karma in india has been a history of the clash of karma optimists the one who wrote the kama sutra who recited who who the in right going back to the rigveda 1500 bc that who said that <clears throat> uh the cosmos was created from the seed of desire who said that you wouldn't if you didn't have desire you know you wouldn't wake up in the morning who who realized that the it was not only creation source of procreation and they even created a god in named kama and and they and this particular god in fact we we can talk about that but it's really uh uh, uh i mean it, it's the only civilization that elevated karma to a goal of life india was and so i i i feel that it's not the victorians only who we should blame it goes right back right back to our roots and it's fine because we in the clash between karma optimists 
and karma pessimists came karma realists and karma realists said yes we we this both extremes are not acceptable sex is all right as long as it's within marriage so that compromise took place in all civilizations and that's what allowed <laughs> the allowed civilization to move to move on talking about uh, sex and marriage mr das i'm going to ask you one more question before i go back to mr varma you have also examined karma from the lens of uh, another aim in the trivarga and purusharth which is uh, dharma right and uh, <clears throat> sometimes dharma and karma are uh, you know they clash and sometimes they are in fact complementary could you give us a brief overview perhaps of the relationship between dharma and karma right well that's actually uh, one of the riddles I, my book is called the riddle of desire and one of the key riddles is the fact that there is no answer sometimes and in 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 my story it's a it's a fictional memoir with a lot of philosophy and history when the mem the narrator keeps stopping the story it's a memoir well it's a, yeah it's a fictional memoir fictional <laughs> memoir please <laughs> amar the main the narrator is not me let's get that very clear so amar has had uh uh you know he's had a good marriage he's had two wonderful children he's in his 40s and he comes to work one day and he's feeling discontented because desire has diminished in his life he's in the fourth stage and and let me just take a minute and tell you this lovely cover by the way that the artist at penguin has worked out is not just lovely uh, but the flowers pavan they signify the five stages of desire the first stage is when the two people meet and there's fascination the white lotus a shoka flower is when they decide to do something about it and this is when there's intimacy and usually marriage and the difficult business of raising children and desire wanes to the fourth stage of desire and that's where amar is right now so he's feeling discontented because desire has waned in his life and a few weeks later he has to go to pune he's in bombay so people who know bombay know that you take the deccan queen from vt station and as he gets into his, his to into the train a beautiful woman walks in and sits close by maybe not quite as close as pavan but she sits nearby and like civilized people they begin to chat and first it's impersonal but slowly there's some attraction and the talk becomes more personal and by the end of the journey it's clear to both of them that they could actually have an affair because the talk has reached that point and so when he leaves the station in pune and goes to wherever he has to go he thinks should he have an affair or not and he says well if i have an affair my marriage will break and i love my wife and i will hurt the person i love the most and also i'll hurt my children but of course children i shouldn't care so much about because they'll go away when they grow up these wretched children ungrateful and then he says well maybe we should keep the affair a secret that maybe it will work but what will be the consequence of keeping it secret well he says we'll i'll have to lie and lies will have to be piled upon more lies and soon i will become an inauthentic human being not being able to tell the difference between a, a truth and a lie so that also he finds unpleasant the thought of doing that and then he says well maybe we shouldn't have an affair and but he says what will be the consequence if i don't have an affair 
And the consequence of that will be that I will, in years to come, resent that I lost the one possible moment of a certain thrilling happiness. And I will resent myself, I'll resent my wife, I'll resent my family, and I may end up as a shriveled, mean, old man. And then he realizes that maybe here there is no answer. Either I betray my wife or I betray myself. And this is the classic conflict between dharma, the duty to, your, to the other, versus a karma, which is a duty to myself. And so, like many times, uh, this, is a tr this is a real dharma sankat, which has no answer. Mr. Verma, uh, Mr. Verma, I would like to um, pick up on something that you touched upon in your first answer and take it a little further and ask you. You know, you talked about, um, I think one of the key things that you spoke about was the openness with which we understood but also debated, were capable of debating karma and that's also come across in what Mr. Das said. Um, in fact, there was, you know, you've talked about karma uh, optimism. There was also the Charavaka school, which was another uh, extreme of it. You mentioned the hoodlums that are going around town, you know, checking young couples, etc. But the cultural uh, discourse and, and this idea of one idea, hegemonic idea of Hindu culture and Hindu religion is gaining ground in this political climate. How does one reconcile that? with the sort of open debate and open discussion the two of you are talking about? Well, usually the evangelism and aggression showed by such elements is in inverse proportion to their knowledge about the culture they are seeking to defend. So, obviously there's a disfunct, there's a disjoint. Uh, you have people saying, for instance, I've just my latest book is a book on Adi Shankaracharya. Uh, you have people laying down what Hinduism is and, to, and saying that those who don't conform to that idea are lesser Hindus. And I entirely disagree with that approach because Hinduism, for instance, is by definition dialogic, inclusive, eclectic and based on a civilized discourse which is Shastrarth. Similarly, where the question of these hoodlums or lumpen elements going around in the name of Indian culture, harassing young couples, I just believe they, 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 they should all be made compulsorily locked in a room and made to read some of the great literature India has produced. From uh, the Bhagavad Puran, the Vishnu Puran, coming to Jaydev, to, to Chandidas, to Bihari, to Keshavdas. I mean, the whole, whole literary and philosophical legacy of India accepts the fact that there is the sensual, but that the sensual need not and should not be pursued in exclusion. That is the lesson of India. And there is a great acceptance. I mean, I, I can't even explain to you the, what is the... You cannot have temples in the public space like Khajuraho or Konarak unless there is public acceptance of the fact that the sensual can be displayed in this manner. And even there they don't understand that while the lower panels are explicitly erotic, the central panel just shows the main deity with, the, with his consort and the, the pinnacle is the trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, Mahadev. So there is a progression, but there is an acceptance that within that cycle, there is a place of the sensual. So there is complete illiteracy. And when that illiteracy becomes aggressive, then the only way is to fight it. Mr. Das, very quickly, you have addressed a karma riddle for our times by saying that there is no connection between love, sex and marriage, I believe. Uh, how do you think the young people of this country might benefit from 
understanding, like Mr. Verma saying, our understanding of the uh, of the karma shastras. Well, quick answer is let's rename Valentine's Day to Kama Deva Divas, <laughs> Kama Utsav, and we'll take the wind out of the sails of the Hindutvas right away. And the second answer is that the young people, I think they are far more liberated than the older lot. And they know that the secret of happiness is to love the work you do and love the person you live with. To that, I think we would add the point that Pavan just made, that we all human beings have capabilities. And these four purusharthas, the four goals of life are expressions of achieving those capabilities. I'm speaking in Aristotelian terms who, talk about, who talked about capabilities, but that was the central idea. That a true, truly happy life, a good life, a flourishing life, consists of fully um, in the grihastha stage, uh, artha and dharma, and artha and karma, and, 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 and later on, you know, the other, other, other uh, goals of life. So I would say the young people actually are way ahead of us already. All we need to do is give them space, change the name of, and, and make it Kama Deva Devas. And, 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 and really they should also, I mean, if they go deeper into the tradition, they will understand that the riddle of desire is partly because desire and love change in every decade of one's life. And wisdom lies not in being like the American husband who comes home one evening from work and he says, honey, I think I've fallen out of love with you. Let's get a divorce. Their approach is, look, we have these stages of life, and we must, the wisdom lies in being able to make each stage a creative stage so that you can live that flourishing life with the same person. That's one of the sort of uh, messages that I at least, even from, you know, the, 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 the writers who were quite happy to have a libertine lifestyle. We will come back to that. But um, Mr. Verma, you spoke about, you've written, in fact, about, you spoke about Kama Sutra in your first answer, but you've, in fact, written on the Kama Sutra. Um, he called it a book of manners, so to speak. Having studied it and written about it, why would you recommend that everybody should really read it and not just look at the pictures? Well, one of the regrets I have is that most people who say they've read, and it's one of the I've written 23 books, it's just one of them, lest you think I only write on the Kama Sutra. But most people who say that they've read the book have only seen the pictures and illustrations. And that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate because it represents a very mature, pragmatic, evolved legacy as an outlook to life. And until you understand that, the book will, you'll never move from prurience to perception, genuine perception. You'll never make that move. Uh, and I'll tell you one thing about the legacy where sensuality is accepted in a larger balanced framework. Nothing in Hin Indian Hindu mythology is random. Nothing. If there is a Sita, there has to be a Radha. If there is Ram who is Maryada Purushottam, there has to be Krishna who is Leela Purushottam. And remember, when Krishna leaves Vrindavan after his frolicking with the gopis, he only goes a few kilometers away to Mathura, but never returns, because each pursued in proportion and none in exclusion. But the gopis are bereft. And Krishna sends his friend Udhav to go and console them. And there is an entire corpus of literature called Brahmar Geet, 
where the gopis taunt Udhav, who are you to lecture to us? Have you experienced the ecstasy that we have? And, 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 and uh, when Krishna still does not return, then they meditate on his absence and that too is a valid path to salvation. It can be bhakti, it can be jnana, it can be karma, it can be the sensual, it can be the absence of sensuality. That is the multi-pronged ways that we accept. Now, the great danger is if you simplify Hinduism, which is an exceptionally complex and layered system, to fiats or diktats, then you are not only being very silly, but you are also devaluing very, very sophisticated system of thought. And that is the real danger. Let me bring together three threads from what you just said, Ecstasy, Experience, and other books that you've written. Your latest book, like you mentioned, is on Adi Shankaracharya. And uh, you write about uh, this incident where he is debating Madhana Mishra. And is after uh, he wins that debate, he is challenged by his wife to uh, debate the Kama Shastras. Tell us about the significance of that incident and that fascinating story in itself. Now, first of all, what may uh, sound fascinating today is that Mandan Mishra and Adi Shakiracharya sat down to have a civilized debate. Because that in itself is a dying species of interaction. But they did. One believed in the Gyanmark, the other believed in the Karmkan theory. They sat down to have a debate and Adi Shankaracharya, and that is again a tribute to the civility of the debate, agreed for Mandan Mishra's wife to be the judge. And it was clear that Mandan Mishra was losing the argument and when he does lose, his wife Ubhay Bharati says, he may have lost, but I am one half of him and therefore you have to debate with me as well. And she says, I will debate with you the Kama Shastra. Now, Adi Shankaracharya is a sannyasi. And he, I'm afraid, among great depths of knowledge, did not have it on this subject. So, he asked for 30 days' time. And he took those, in that period, as the story goes, because folklore, legend, ideology, everything meld into the making of what could be an inference you derive from philosophy. So in that period, there is a young prince of a state who has died, and Adi Shankaracharya, by his yogic powers, incarnates himself in his body. The prince miraculously revives, and Adi Shankaracharya then has the opportunity and experience to understand the pleasures of the flesh with the wives in the harem or whatever of that young prince. Now, what is the irony of the story is that he begins to enjoy himself so much that he forgets what his real calling is, which is to come back and, and, and go back to preaching Advait. So, some of his disciples have to come before him and sing Nirgun Bhajans to remind him what his real calling is. And then he... Now, why, was, why is this story? Then he, of course, goes and assumes his body, goes back for the debate, wins the debate. In fact, Ubhay Bharti becomes his disciple, as does Mandan Mishra. But why this incident? Once again, it points to the fact that even in the life of someone who is considered among the most powerful, influential, and certainly for his sheer cerebral profundity, one of the greatest minds in Hinduism, even in his life, the sensual could play a role, that he could be beguiled by it, that he could for a moment lose sight of his larger goals by the sheer attraction. Read Tulsi Das's Ram Charitmanas. When Kamdev is going on the request of the other gods to break Shiva's meditation, those lines are beautiful. The attraction of Kam is such that everything begins to bow, bend towards him. The plants, the trees, the birds, the, the fragrance, the, the, the sheer power of attraction is such. And these are lines in Tulsi Das's Ramcharitmanas. In fact, let me add, when Shiva's eye opens, when just like Greek mythology, 
the arrow is fired by calm and shiva wakes up from his meditation and in anger his third eye opens and he burns calm to ashes and then when he is awake from meditation he asks parvati ask for a boon ask me what can i do for you what can i give you and she says what is there to ask now that you have destroyed calm revive him and shiva says now that i have destroyed him i can't revive him in his physical form but calm will continue to live in a formless manner ananga ananga and that is exactly how he is operating on this audience right now <laughs> mr das you have um studied and uh, uh, you know uh, explored the idea of karma uh, not just through indian texts but also through western thinkers greek philosophers the bible yeah. austin very interestingly uh, shekhov shakespeare proust uh, freud and so on and so forth could you tell us some of the key differences between the way we approach the idea of desire and the west has well i don't think you can separate it you could separate christ the way christianity approached it where it was guilt and shame and original sin versus the way the rigveda approached it where it was the source of creation but the the some of the influences are are different and for example you know when amar is in this conflict in this sad state when he realizes there's no answer about having an affair with amaya you know he says to him he thinks to himself why does it have why does sex have to be so complicated why can't it be like a game of tennis that you can go to the club play for a few hours then go home to dinner and you know uh everything is okay and the answer is given actually in one of the french texts why it can't be a game of tennis and it is about the fact that um desire unlike animals who uh experience a very natural desire like human beings and they fulfill it in human beings have the capacity for imagination and so we have an we have this pro, charming pro, proclivity to express that in terms of fixating on one person and that's romantic love and then we think uh, we have fantasized and we think that this is the only person for us the perfect soulmate or whatever you may call it which is of course the whole problem of romantic love this idea of the perfect soulmate which creates you know if you've seen bridget jones's diary what the problem for every woman in the west is that she gets into her 30s and then because nobody else has been good enough the boy next door is not good enough and therefore she has she's getting at that time panicking about about it anyway that's a diversion but the point i was trying to make is that here i think we have a a situation which explains that fundamentally human beings experience jealousy now some animals must also experience some but human beings have a territoriality once they fall in love and so the question of hurting the other person becomes very important and 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 so that's why one of the reasons why it can't become a a game of tennis and i just wanted to actually uh take up from a strand that pavan started because i discovered that there is something universal it's not the difference you were talking about but i i discovered that actually romantic love was born at the same time on three continents in the 12th century in the west it was expressed during the time of the sh- the troubadours and the, the 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 culture of 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 chivalry you know king arthur and and lancelot and all 
in the, uh, it, it, the greatest text was Tristan and, Tristan and Isolde, which Wagner made into a great opera. In the Islamic world, at the same time, it was in Persia, in Iran, where Naizami's story of Laila and Majnu. And in India, in Eastern India, it is the story of Radha and Krishna. By the way, I pref any day prefer Radha to Sita. And the, what is interesting about Jaidev's poem that Pavan talked about is that you never know whether it is human love or divine love. The magic of Jaidev is that here in India is the only is, is, is unique that it turned to romantic love, I mean to divine love. But here's divine love where it's not just as Chaitanya and the myst mystics, are, I mean the, all the whole tradition of bhakti would make us believe that it's the yearning of the soul for divine. It's actually Krishna who's yearning also for Radha. So God, not yearning, for, not wishing for the whole human race, which is what God's supposed to do, but one woman, and she's married. So it's, it's the adulterous love for, I mean, that's what makes our tradition so nuanced and so rich. And so, you know, what I, I find, what I found so attractive in doing the research for my book was that, you know, you told a wonderful story. And, and there are wonderful stories in the Mahabharat where, for example, one place, Yudhishthir asks Bhishma, who gets more pleasure from sex, a man or a woman? And Bhishma says, well, you have to be both a man and a woman to answer that question. And then he remembers that there was a king, Bangashwana, who was in half of his life, he was a king, a man, and then he changed into a woman. So because he was a good human being, at the end of his life, he is uh, asked, well, look, now you can choose uh, what you want to be in your next life. And what would you like to be, a man or a woman? And he says, a woman. And people say, are you crazy? You could be the emperor. You've been a king. And why would you want to be a woman? And he says, well, a woman gets more pleasure from sex, but also he says that she has a very rich, much richer emotional life. And he says, I've, dis I've found out that the emotional life is far richer than the public life of a king or a CEO. He doesn't use the word CEO, of course. But, and this reminded me of E.M. Foster, who said, you know, he wrote a book called Two Chairs for Democracy. And people said, but why two chairs? Why not three chairs for democracy? And he said, because I reserve three chairs for the private life, for the emotional life, which is far richer, like King Bangashwana, than the public life. Okay, we're running out of time. Uh, but Mr. Verma, I want to quickly ask you, you have examined um, and that's just one of the things that you've done. But the conflict between dharma and karma uh, in a long poem on Yudhishthir and Draupadi. Why did you pick this tale to examine this conflict? And what does it tell us about dharma and karma? Well, I didn't write the, the long poem which Gulzar Sahib has translated uh, and written a play on it to illustrate dharma and karma. It's very clear that when Kunti says, share between you what you have, as I write in the poem, it's 14 line rhymed sonnets. Lust singes the eyes of the other brothers, not only Arjun, because now they will share what Arjun had won. So that's, that is something, and Draupadi is such a strong woman, and Yudhishthir most of his life is such a wimp that I wanted to explore the relationship between these two characters. But I just wanted to, because the time has gone, to comment on whether a man or a woman, who enjoys it more, Bhima. Actually, Vatsyayan, I don't know what his field research was. But whatever it was, 
It was quite accurate. He says a woman's libido, and he put a precise ratio, 18 times to that of a man. <laughs> okay, very quickly, absolutely last question to both of you. Both of you have written about, you know, uh, taking off from Yudhishthir and Draupadi. You know, one gets the sense towards the end of that poem that Yudhishthir is angry a little bit with himself at his own desire and also blaming Draupadi a little bit uh, perhaps for it and this is obviously so reminiscent of this uh, sort of patriarchal trope of uh, men blaming women for eliciting desire rather than owning up to their own wrongdoings or shortcomings. Both of you have written about how there's been a parallel tradition in India, in, in Bharat rather, parallel to patriarchal orthodoxy of imagining the woman as strong and free rather than weak and submissive. Very quickly, because it's International Women's Day, last words on that, starting with you, Mr. Das. Well, um, the, all the characters in, in the Mahabharat, all the women are strong. Kunti, Draupdi, Gandhari, uh, before that, Satyavati, and, 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 and they, in comparison to the men, they're much stronger. And, and in fact, that's why I, I prefer the Mahabharata to the Ramayana. And, and uh, the, 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 the point, I guess, is that I think, to me, this period, the last four, five months, has been a very good period for breaking patriarchy. And I applaud the Supreme Court to have started it with triple talaq, with uh, decriminalizing homosexuality, with decriminalizing adultery, both of which were Victorian, with, were, were English, uh, were with colonial impositions, with the entry of women into temples. And finally, the point to make about Me Too is that at a time when globalization is under threat from Mr. Trump, from Brexit, from Mr. Modi, here is an idea which started a year ago in America, and it has spread like wildfire around the globe. You can Google the Me Too map of the world, and you see that even Muslim Kazakhstan has a vigorous Me Too movement. And so I think for, on Women's Day, I think it's worth celebrating that these are all blows against patriarchy. And I don't want to leave us with an impression that, you know, the past in India was just so wonderful. It was patriarchal. I mean, let's be honest. We, are, we, were, we, we had a great liberation in the Gupta period. You had the Kama Sutra and other Sanskrit love poetry, etc. But it was patriarchy. And now I think the fight has to be relentless. Uh, the fight for civil, civil, civilization, to be fully civilized, we have to, we have to you know, keep pushing against patriarchy. Amen to that. Last words. Uh, last I'll comment. make it briefer. I think really the lesson is that while, of course, I congratulate you and all women on International Women's Day, we've had a tendency of glorifying women when they are goddesses. And sh the Shakti movement in India is one of the strongest of this kind of movement anywhere in the world. Every mutt of Adi Shankaracharya has a Shakti Peet, which is a recognition of the sheer power of the female principle. But between the ideal and the real, there is still much too big a gulf, in spite of the many steps that have been taken, which Gurcharan talks about. So I think that the battle is still on. Because it's International Women's Day, we'll choose to look at the glass as half full. Thank you very much for talking to us and thank you for listening to us.